Hello, I'm Marius Grootveld and in this talk I'll try to explain something about the history of alternative histories, an exhibition that we curated in, collaborate, in collaboration with the Drawing Matter Foundation and the Architecture Foundation. Um, for us this project uh, started in two places at the same time, uh, both in uh, Portugal, in Malaguera, a neighborhood by Tiza, as well as in Somerset in the Drawing Matter Archive. Uh, ran by uh, Neil Hophouse. Thinking back on how this uh, project uh, started, these two places seem to always be very present in our mind. We've uh, visited them uh, only a few months apart and um, many of the thoughts uh, that are at the base of this presentation started in these incidental spaces within uh, this village in uh, Portugal as well as within the drawings from the archive in Malaguerra. Um, but there's of course also another aspect that binds these two uh, places together and that's, and that's the drawings of uh, Alfaro Siza. Uh, where uh, the drawing archive uh, holds uh, two sets of um, uh, drawing book, books, uh, large sets, um, uh, uh, showing the, the design thoughts um, of CISA, of the uh, Evora project in Porto, as well as the Maraguera housing project in Evra, east of Lisbon. And it's somehow looking at these sketches, uh, browsing through these orange sketch sketchbooks, um, shortly after we visited the place, that um, both the built form as well as the design ideas developing from page to page in the sketchbooks were explaining something about the way CISA worked and the way the project worked um, in in a more multi-directional way than we would have thought. And from it, we started off with the project by looking at the drawings of the archive and finding uh, an unexpected meaning. Um, the archive is an, an archive mainly with sketches uh, sketchbooks uh, more than very formal drawings and in a way we are also most interested in these because somehow these sketches they contain a fragment of an idea that that is had at a certain point in time I'm thinking of the process and they don't have to be complete they can they can explore a facet and what what's interesting in these sketchbooks of CISA um, is also that he, besides the buildings, always draws the places that he visited, visits and the people next to the sketches of uh, the architecture. Um, so there are these beautiful spreads where he travels these small villages with um, walled city uh, 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 centers. Um, and the funny thing is, if you then browse on and you see the architecture next to it, all of a sudden you indeed understand where these th th thoughts come from. Uh, and he even makes it explicit by uh, drawing in front of his own design the same cow or horse, uh, four-legged animal, uh, as he draws in the observation that he had to somehow um, uh, derive uh, the design thoughts, the atmosphere that he has in mind from this, this place in history. Um, and so this is a very beautiful, beautiful link I think you find in these sketchbooks, but having visited uh, the place uh, shortly before, all of a sudden um, you start to think about what is the relationship between the sketch and, and the built form? So rather than the sketch and the observation uh, of another architecture, 
how does the sketch relate to the build form? And um, something that struck me was somehow that this architecture that he built has a had a similar kind of incompleteness to to his sketches. Um, he built these buildings with these jagged, unfinished edges, um, and they almost become like incidental ornaments to uh, windows and it's clearly explicit uh, because for instance here where there's this big raw center block built viaduct running through the uh, village he uh, then uh, builds a house uh, next to it and he somehow emphasizes this incident by 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 framing this raw stone together with a very fine marble uh, in a white wall. Um, so, so these qualities of these sketches, where he somehow draws very clear shapes but let them lets them crumble uh, at the edges of his paper, he somehow definitely tries to to capture this idea within the build form. Also in the Buka project in uh, Porto, uh, he uh, tries to convey a certain kind of speed, some kind of fast fastness. Uh, um, uh, everything is 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 very swiftly drawn. He even writes the text in a certain kind of um, uh, uh, velocity. Uh, the pages are empty to emphasize this single shape on it and and again this is communicated clearly into into the project um so these sketches they, they consist of these constant repeating rhythms that just keep on flowing over the page and they have no beginning and no end and they just keep on come on speeding through um, and of course, this is also in the build form clearly the case with these these staircases that just keep on repeating one after the other, not stopping. And of course, you could say this is a conceptual thing, but what I really like about Caesar is that he then also has these moments where he then seems to, in the build form, uh, leave something unfinished. So as if he had to draw the other step because the sketch was there even though there's not a house anymore um so so the build form really somehow holds this 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 way of of drawing this way of sketching um and um some things start to misalign because of the speed some elements just run into a wall because of the speed and in the corners there is beautiful um uh, staircases where these windows of houses which were never built uh, somehow make this kind of exterior interior shape uh, where um where uh, purely coming from the speed of the sketch and somehow looking at these sketches the idea arrived that maybe the initial sketch and the way you make it on which what kind of paper with what kind of pen in what kind of position do you do you draw on the train do you do you draw behind a, a drawing desk on the computer that that already influences the final build form so much uh, and that that you somehow really have to draw in a certain way to make a um, a certain kind of architecture and in a way that by drawing a certain way, you can somehow take on a certain kind of persona, a certain kind of identity uh, and take over a certain kind of, yeah, way of showing certain things and not showing other things. And looking at the archive further, you start to see this theory more and more. So for instance, of course, the, uh, the engineering faculty by uh, James Sterling and James Gowen, um, when you look at these initial uh, drawings, these initial uh, sketches uh, on gridded paper, maybe something that was just laying around on the desk, but all of a sudden you're wondering, 
if this this grid of this this sheet uh, wasn't a more important player in 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 creating this an innocent player an unintended an intended player in creating this this final building which is of course also very much systematic and has this kind of yeah, you almost can feel the gridded paper through the the built building these roofs for instance they're still these original grids of these doodles present in these roofs so again a drawing as a persona if you then look at these other sketchbooks of Goen, you start to see these similarities with Sisa as well where beyond his architecture he also uh, draws like things he sees um, and somehow these two start to influence each other so he sees the cars and some other building slowly becomes a car. So that's actually also a fascinating uh, thing when you look at these initial ideas. And I've somehow tried to then see what do drawing styles say about architecture and, and isn't it, wouldn't a drawing style be a way to categorize a certain kind of architecture as a certain drawing style would ensue a certain kind of architecture. Uh, so does these graphical drawings of for Rossi uh, ensue a certain kind of graphical architecture? Um, and when I then put them next to the pictures of my visit, you really do see this relationship. And then you could also make these very funny, funny uh, sets where you, you, you pick architects who draw in a similar way uh, and ask the question, is their architecture also similar? And this is actually, I think, quite a nice uh, superposition, for instance, Rossi and Eisenman, where uh, I've never, would have never put them together because the one is so much related to history and the other one is so much related to mathematics. So somehow, theoretically, they come from a completely different angle, but somehow their drawing style somehow is kind of similar. Uh, for certain kind of presentation drawings and it raises the question doesn't their architecture look a bit alike as well in certain kind of graphical styles and I do think that's the case so for me it's somehow unearthing a whole new way of looking at at drawings um, and then you're you're putting these other architects together like of completely different eras like Hans Pulzig and Paul Robrecht where their architecture posts also has a certain kind of fleetingness, a certain kind of um, ephemeral, undefined, uh, yeah, flowing space. Uh, they both have this quality also in their build work and they make a similar kind of sketch. So all of a sudden these drawings start to communicate with each other and they, they ask questions to each other. Um, for instance, these, uh, where uh, Archisum creates these drawings that feel like 17th century uh, uh, tractate on architecture. Uh, and, and maybe they want to evoke this kind of attitude in, um, in what they're trying to communicate. Uh, and then also there are these, these unexpected parallels uh, which somehow uh, yeah raise a lot of beautiful questions uh, is Peter Merkley uh, in a way connected to a certain kind of Viennese sensation style uh, I do think there is something there in his work even though I wouldn't have found it straight away but looking at these drawings and then looking at his buildings there's clearly a relation and inspiration there um, is this pencil drawing collage uh, within a photograph of Mies somehow uh, a forefather of the continuous monument who also drew with pencil within a photograph? And of course, um, uh, clear fascinations f f of the young, early John Heideck for this um, international style architecture also taking on this kind of 
way of drawing. So the project really starts from the drawing and really starts from the sketch. Um, we, we also had the pleasure in the process uh, after the first year working on the project to, um, to, uh, to, to visit some offices and talk to them about their, their sketches. Here we are uh, in Zurich um, looking at the sketchbooks of uh, Jonathan Sergeson who seems to quite consciously uh, take on uh, two kind of uh, hand drawing personas. Um, one is the, is the loose sketch, uh, which is still very precise. He always draws uh, similar corners from similar angles and keeps on var varying from page to page, really switching to completely different versions of the same view quite rapidly. And then later he switches over to this super precise uh, ruler uh, drawing where he really looks at the plan, draws every space measured exact by hand, but also in the facade really uh, sets up the system uh, clearly. So I do feel that the projects from the uh, Zurich uh, branch uh, of uh, Sergus and Bates do have this kind of rational uh, delineated uh, systems in there in, in the way that they are composed and, and, and I do think it's it's from this 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 hand-drawn rule ruler approach um, we also went to the office of Luchens Padmanaba they always try to look for these contradictions between these more classical mannerist forms of architecture uh, as well as these more um, almost super functional uh, American uh, architectures uh, like here this plan of Venturi um, and also in their work they're somehow trying to to combine this this computer exactness with uh, a hand-drawn um, um, iteration. So they always print out their plan uh, and then they will always take a TPEX bottle and correct the plan and redraw pieces of it. And the process always has to be linear. Um, so the, the plan always evolves to a next step and there are never variations made. Uh, and somehow through this linear process, uh, accidents, uh, incidents uh, occur, and um, the project has this beautiful. These projects have this beautiful mix between these very rational systems that misalign at certain points, um, and you really see somehow the atmosphere of the facades that they want to create uh, by these TPEX corrections. Lastly, we also went to the offices of uh, um, Knapkeets and Fikert, which somehow want to be super exact in their uh, way of looking at architecture. And for them, the computer render is somehow the perfect tool where they are even in, in the design process, um, only looking at, at lighted, materialized, perfect renders uh, one by one. Uh, rather than just using these renders to, to explain what they're meaning after. So this, the exactness of the render becomes a tool to think about architecture. Um, and then beyond that, there's of course, uh, images from trips, but also again, an exact tool being the photograph or the postcard that they bought in the stand. Um, so in a way, the whole project was somehow an, effort to get into the mindset of how a thought is put down in a temporary project, being a sketch, being a drawing, being a render. Um, but it's also about how thoughts of different architects relate and uh, how when we look at drawings of others or drawings of ourselves, 
of our earlier selves, we somehow distill certain kind of thoughts. They always somehow are like building blocks for for next and newer thoughts. Um, and one of the problems, of course, with these archives is that that they're mainly accessed by um, historians who somehow try to put the drawing in its historic context and try to uh, to somehow to explain how that drawing came to be. Um, but one of the beautiful things of the drawing meta archive is, of course, that, that somehow it also is greatly accessible for the current architectural um, uh, discourse. Uh, and there's also many architects uh, taking ideas from them. And in the project, we somehow wanted to lay this process bare by asking contemporary architects to take an historic drawing and uh, pretend as if they made that drawing in a previous life, as if it was their own drawing, uh, and then work further on that drawing as if it was one of their own sketches, and if then they had a next thought behind that furthering the design process. Um, and then fittingly to uh, a sketch a drawing in a design process, they would make a model in a design process. So somehow a sketch of an historic architect and a model of a contemporary architect, both completing one singular uh, design process. Um, so we went through this archive with a group of over 80 architects in mind. And as I said before, we is uh, the Architecture Foundation here at Woodman on the left, and Neil Hophaus of the Drawing Matter Foundation, as well as me here and my partner, uh, Jantje Engels. Um, um, and um, the funny thing was that we then really got to, to typecast these drawings to contemporary architects, sometimes uh, giving them something that we knew they would like. Uh, some aware these ideas would already be greatly in line uh, with their own work. Sometimes giving them something that we knew they wouldn't like. Um, uh, creating some kind of a, a pleasant friction to somehow deal with for these architects. I do think that certain architects prefer the one above the other and other prefer the other above the one. Um, so we sent out this quite open brief and the only limitation was that the drawing, the, the model should somehow fit in the footprint of the drawing. Um, and we got this beautiful set of models back. Um, uh, even though we asked only for sketch models, most of them were, um, of course, beautifully made and uh, went way beyond the sketch model. Uh, but they were all research, researches into design ideas and they, they weren't presentation models as it were. They were, were really pieces of exploration, um, which I really like. No, so to show a few, maybe, um, this is a, a drawing of an underground uh, city by uh, Walter Peichler. Um, and uh, it feels like this monumental uh, underground world, science fiction, um, something in a far distant future. Um, and Bell Architecture from Zurich um, took it as a challenge to, to compare it to a most banal piece of underground city as we would find today in a subway. Um, making this incredibly meticulous drawing with every little fence detailed out, um, but somehow the 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 unspectacular reading of the sketch in the, it, which makes it maybe ever so more beautifully. Uh, Otto Schönthal um, makes this this glass architecture dome um, uh, where uh, Thomas Dierichs uh, with, an, with a local artist from Rotterdam uh, uh, created this uh, contemporary uh, folly of it. Um, 
uh, uh, façade sketched by Hans Pulsig. Uh, Hans Pulsig, for me, maybe most related to uh, the office of uh, Carissa St. John. Uh, you definitely feel that, that, that his work is very important in their, their practice. So we, we, maybe with them, we really wanted to see what would happen if we would put them so closely to the source. And they, they created this wonderful, or uh, Peter uh, uh, St. John together with Sue Thomas created this wonderful sculpture uh, of like a, like a Pulsig factory that, that somehow uh, was never cleaned over the past uh, 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 100 years. Um, um, yeah, creating maybe a, a more circus and Bates, more Pulsig piece than ever. Um, uh, Hayatsu architects Takeshi, uh, we gave the primitive hut to, um, uh, where Hayatsu then also went looking for architecture within uh, uh, nature. Uh, and in his London context, his nature was, of course, uh, the London parks. And he collected twigs from Hyde Park and he, he, he built a primitive hut from these twigs and cast them in bronze, uh, creating this beautiful, fragile piece. This drawing of the large crematorium by Gunnar Asplund in the Woodland Cemetery was given to uh, Johann Selsing, the son of uh, Peter Selsing, who in a way uh, would probably have been taught by Asplund. Um, so there was this clear... Uh, cultural relationship and we thought it would then be an interesting uh, uh, connection to, to, to have him work further on that design and Johan created this very unexpected but very beautiful styrofoam model of the space somewhat emphasizing its, its womb like uh, uh, quality and for me this was an incredibly striking model because not only um, did it somehow continue these design ideas uh, present within Asplund's drawing? It's, but it also somehow, for me, uh, had me look differently back on this piece of architecture that's built there today. So, so, so Johan even even changed the design in my mind uh, that is built purely by by shedding a new light on it. So. So all of a sudden, the the current built form really is uh, something that's built off both uh, Gunnar Asplund as well as uh, Johan Selsing. Um, the Peter Merkley sketch uh, with these little friezes uh, present uh, on top of the central columns uh, was given to... Um, um, Mikael Bergquist, um, who then also incorporated this other reference, which which I directly felt in the model as well. The, the, this 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 house of out of Los in um, Vienna, this, this boring grey house with this set of three Greek friezes in the facade. He always said that was there. He, I think even there's a version where he somehow pasted it on, uh, and it's. It, it somehow then also starts to raise this question about um, how you read other people's ideas, but but also like how these ideas really live on in the collective uh, uh, understanding of of these ideas, and that somehow people share these ideas, and uh, and 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 that is not just a one to one process, but it, that somehow this group. Of architects which are present in this present in this in this um, in this uh, exhibition really share some kind of a, um, space in their minds which overlaps. Uh, Wim Wim and finally uh, the model of Wim Wim goes Wim Goes, um, which is this this uh, uh, folly. Uh, which we all know with these 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 real wooden columns um, 
um, carrying the roof, uh, and and somehow Vim continued this this thought process by using more natural elements to somehow create tectonics, and by beyond the column of the of the of the the root, the the tree, uh, there's now also the weight of the stone uh, pulling it down, bringing this. From a classical structure into like a tension structure that we would mo know more in uh, uh, 20, uh, uh, 21st century, uh, 20th century. Um, so maybe also to tell something more about the exhibition and, and the catalogue. Um, together with uh, Guus Kaandorp, uh, one of my old uh, childhood friends, we went out and uh, documented the uh, exhibition. And both the way we're um, showing the models uh, in the exhibition itself and the way we're documenting the exhibition, we've tried to find a way to, to just show the pieces side by side as an archive. Uh, somehow, um, allowing the visitor to to make their own connections uh, within it um, uh, also inspired by these these documents of enlightenment by uh, durand here where he is trying to take these buildings from all around europe and and, and organizing them side by side uh, uh, trying to draw parallels himself or these documents of uh, Napoleon, uh, where he went to his new Egypt uh, with a large caravan of scientists who also uh, would just categorize everything they, they find, found. Um, and of course, um, uh, these this encyclopedia made by uh, Dennis Diderot, uh, 24 volumes of drawings and text, uh, where he goes to every, um, every different profession and just draws how they do their profession and what kind of tools to use. Uh, almost an unimaginably large exercise, but which in the end, due to its volume, found the meaning. I mean, you can really imagine Durand somehow um, making his first drawing on the sheet in the book, uh, just starting in a, in a corner of one of these workshops, somehow having these completely arbitrary objects that he draws, which somehow are just themselves. Um, but just by, by putting everything next to each other, um, the relations that are there in reality also somehow start to show on paper. Uh, and and, and we, we were hoping not to be too curatorial in the way we, 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 we show the pieces of the exhibition, um, but to, to just put the objects next to each other in this, in this larger furniture piece, a furniture piece without a beginning and also without an end. Uh, it's not filled yet uh, and and hope that the submissions of these offices which were all very uh, cared for um, would find would show the relations that they had in between the, in between them So also in the exhibition furniture, we, we just encounter the documentation of the work delivered side by side, where all the models somehow find themselves in this large cardboard structure, uh, each in its own room, um, but not with all rooms filled. And also this structure was based on a uh, drawing from the archive. This uh, um, uh, balcony uh, arrangement of a theater, uh, a section 
uh, also showing these uh, it, it's almost like a scaled model no with like uh, little um, um, pilasters carrying um, beams uh, where people are sitting in it and some of the peeping people become giants in these in this in these temples that are built for them um, so in a way very much a piece for display we thought uh, but also it reminds of course of these 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 um, sheets of uh, uh, Durand where he somehow just categorizes uh, all the things within it um, so the 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 exhibition furniture is a continuation of this design process where um, it's like a scale model where you have these rooms uh, with little doors in it and behind each door um, there is a model um, um, and uh, through this method um, uh, the models either become enormous uh, because the the room place with their skill um, uh, or the whole exhibition furniture feels like a small paper model as um, it's consists out of these kind of cardboard sheets which you could imagine you build in small uh, from uh, paper just sliding it together it's somehow not built as a furniture piece it's built as a as a paper paper model so in both both directions like the section sketch there is this translation of scale um, as well as uh, that it's this archival cupboard just containing the models uh, for the visitor to look at and for the visitor to draw the parallels in between it's also a big object it's like the big it's a big mountain in in the space and it's also doing something with the space it's in the, the exhibition has traveled it's uh, traveled from um, from uh, london uh, to uh, brussels here now it's in uh, dublin uh, and it will go to bordeaux probably in the near future um, but each space as you could see here was completely different starting in this more industrial uh, unfinished uh, store space to this old industrial uh, 19th century building 20th century building um, uh, within brussels um, converted into the architecture museum to this this these almost victorian uh, Dublin uh, spaces with these beautiful decorated rooms uh, where the structure finds itself every time anew but because of its size the space around it always changes so you can see here how the room changes around the object um, and uh, there's always a new relationship between the space it stands in and the, the the furniture piece where the models are in so maybe to go back to these pictures that we took with Guus Kaandorp um, uh, they were also strongly inspired by these uh, these books um, and we almost try to create some kind of uh, encyclopedia of uh, of um, of uh, the works that we found that got sent to us. Another important book for this was this tool guide where they had these beautiful uh, pictures of uh, uh, tool heads, um, which they also cut out on a white sheet, almost making them giving them this impression of these enlightened documents. Uh, trying to describe the world even though here they were just tools so we, we took pictures of these models Gus and I did um, but we did it in a way which 
in a way you can't do. Um, uh, they are cabinet oblique pictures. Uh, of course, a vantage point where the front is flat and uh, the the axonometric uh, lines into depth uh, go under an angle. No camera can can shoot. So they had to be modified and reconstructed later on the computer, um, resulting in these these very exact descriptions of these models, but also going beyond the picture, maybe closer to the 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 idea, just the object which was present in the mind of these architects, showing them as these built forms. Um, within the publication, they were laid out, some only shown from one side, some from two sides, some from four sides, depending on uh, their need. Um, if a model was multi-sided, um, uh, telling different stories from different angles, more sides would be shown. If one side would tell the story of the model fully, only one side would be shown. So, of course, a very Hiller and Bernd Becher-esque way of showing objects. In a way, Hiller and Bernd Becher, the more contemporary, enlightened uh, documenta documentators and encyclopedists of industrial heritage. This is all then um, put together in this beautiful publication by uh, Matthias Cloutou, the graphic designer, who in a way very fittingly to the idea of the exhibition also just collected uh, the material into this one big binding, uh, not even um, taking the 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 care to make a book out of it it's just a stack of papers bound together which could be in a way arranged in any way uh, also the cover changes uh, depending on which version you get um, so here you can see these spreads and uh, beyond these spreads there's also the drawings as well as these beautiful pictures by uh, thomas adank um, really getting close to the models showing their material quality, showing their texture. Um, um, yeah, really ex explaining another, another facet of what these models are about. Um, and yeah, they work very well. Um, and what I really do like about uh, these pictures by Thomas Adank is that you're almost confused as to if you're looking at a close-up of a drawing or if you're looking at a close-up of, um, of uh, a model uh, and you're confused about which came first. In the end, if you look very closely, you, you could really imagine that both this model and the drawing are from the same same thought from the same piece uh, from the same same um, same work uh, and that's exactly what we try to achieve uh, in this exhibition so that was the history of alternative histories i hope this uh, answered some questions or maybe uh, raised some questions even better um, i'm always happy to talk further uh, in the future um, uh, for now, thank you for listening and uh, I hope to see you soon.